Welcome to Phoenix, Arizona, the city of rebirth. According to ancient Egyptian or Greek mythology, the phoenix is a large colorful bird, probably red and yellow, who lives for 500 years and then burns itself to ashes. From these ashes, a new phoenix is born. But why is there a beautiful mural of a phoenix bird in Sky Harbor, the international airport in Phoenix, Arizona? Or for that matter, why is this city named Phoenix? The city of Phoenix, Arizona, is the fifth most populous city in the U.S. and with a population of 1.7 million, the only state capital with over 1 million people. The entire metropolitan area of Phoenix, or Metro Phoenix, actually boasts 4.9 million people as of 2019, making it the 10th largest metropolitan area in the U.S. This is why it was named Phoenix, the reborn firebird, by Lord Philip Darrell Dupa in 1868. He suggested the name to his friend Jack Swilling when both settled the valley and set up farms to provide for the nearby mining town of Wickenburg. Lord Dupa had noticed the extensive system of canals dug 2,000 years ago by ancient people and visualized their new settlement as a reborn city. These ancient people were the Hohoka, which means those who are gone. Around 50,000 Hohokam lived in the valley and dug up to 1,000 miles of canals before they moved away, for unknown reasons. Some say it was due to periods of severe floods and drought between 1300 and 1450 CE. Later, tribes such as mainly the Akimel O'odam, but also the Tohono O'odam, the Maricopa, the Yavapai, and the Apache, lived in villages in this area. After the end of the Mexican-American War in 1848, the Phoenix area was ceded by Mexico to the United States and became part of the New Mexico Territory. In 1853, the U.S. paid Mexico $10 million for a piece of land necessary for a southern transcontinental railroad. This transaction came to be known as the Gadsden Purchase. Now, the New Mexico Territory expanded so much that a separate Arizona Territory was proposed. In 1856, Arizonans petitioned for a separate Arizona Territory, but the proposal was defeated repeatedly both in the House and the Senate. Out of frustration and impatience, the Arizonans formed their own provisional territorial government in April 1860. However, when the Civil War broke out, Arizona delegates voted twice to secede from the Union. Confederate President Jefferson Davis agreed to admit them to the Confederacy and created the Confederate Territory of Arizona in August 1861 with its capital at Mesilla. On the other hand, now that Congress was free of Southern legislators, the bill finally passed in 1863, and the Arizona Territory was formally added to the Union on February 24th. By the way, although most of the action during the Civil War took place far away in the East, Arizona did see one battle. The Battle at Picacho Peak Pass, which is the westernmost battle of the Civil War, but also the smallest in terms of numbers. A skirmish rather than a battle. On April 15, 1862, 12 cavalry troopers and one scout under Union Lieutenant James Barrett surprised 10 rebels, Arizona Confederate pickets, commanded by Sergeant Henry Holmes. The shootout lasted a couple of hours, ending with three killed and three wounded on the Union side, and three captured and two wounded on the Confederate side. While they did not have cameras, of course, at the time, capturing the battle scenes, these images come from the reenactments that have taken place annually at Pikachu Peak until 2017, when they were stopped due to lack of funds. But let's return to the story of Phoenix. Phoenix has not always been the capital of Arizona. The first capital was actually Tucson, 
which was then the most populous city in Arizona Territory. But since it was strongly confederate, the capital was moved northward to Prescott, which had more Union influence. Well, in 1867, it was moved back to Tucson by Governor Richards McCormick, but 10 years later was voted back to Prescott. Politicians had fun in those days. Hmm. Finally, in 1889, the legislature settled the dispute by proposing to move the capital to Phoenix, which was located midway between Prescott and Tucson. Now, the vote promised to be a close race. According to historians, a legislator from Yavapai County, that's where Prescott is located, spent the night before the vote at the district on Walnuts Creek with a lady of the evening named Kissing Jenny and placed his glass eye in a glass of water. Apparently, the lady woke up in the night thirsty and mistakenly swallowed the eye as she gulped down the water. The legislator was too embarrassed to appear in public without his eye, and thus the bill passed and the capital moved to Phoenix. It is said that Jenny had been bribed by the Maricopa legislators to drink that eye and that she refused or was unable to give back the eye in the morning. <coughs> well, One of the reasons for choosing Phoenix, in fact, was that Phoenix was not so small anymore. In 1881, when Phoenix was incorporated as a city, its population had already reached almost 2,500. Soon after, on July 4, 1887, the railroad reached the valley, turning Phoenix into a trade center connecting eastern and western markets. Arizonans could reach California in less than a day. People started building houses made of bricks from El Paso instead of adobe or rocks. In 1911, the Salt River Dam, then the largest masonry dam in the world, was completed and formed what is known today as Roosevelt Lake, northeast of Phoenix. Thus, water and electricity became more available. In 1912, on February 14, Arizona was finally admitted as a state, the 48th and last of the contiguous states. It is only followed by Alaska and Hawaii. Arizonan women also gained the suffrage in the same year, preceding the rest of the country by eight years. What with the Hoover Dam, completed in 1935, meaning what? More water, more electricity? Lots of cheap land, low taxes, and a very hot, dry climate, good for tuberculosis and allergy sufferers, more and more people moved into Phoenix. Arizona's economy grew on the five C's, climate, cotton, citrus, copper, and cattle. But this is changing as cotton fields and orange groves make way to more and more housing development. The climate has remained a great draw as more and more retirement communities are built. So, from 1900 to 1950, that's just 50 years, the population of Phoenix grew from 5,500 to 107,000. Well, growth took off like crazy after that, and today Phoenix Metro boasts over 4.5 million inhabitants, out of the 7.2 million in Arizona. That's more than half of the population of Arizona. Now let's close the story of Phoenix with two more tales of rebirth. The first story starts in 1927 in Seattle, where a man named Boyce Luther Gully lived with his wife Frances and his little daughter, four-year-old Mary Lou. On the weekends, the family would go to the beach and build sand castles. However, when they returned the next week, the castle they'd built would be gone, washed away by the waves. Mary Lou would cry, and his father would console her, promising her that one day he'd build her castle where the sea couldn't reach. One day, Boyce Gully left in the morning for work as usual, but never returned. Ever. Days, months, and years passed. Seventeen years later, a lawyer knocked on their door and asked whether they were Mrs. Francis Gully and Miss Mary Lou Gully. Yes, they were. Well, the lawyer told them Mr. Boyce Luther Gully had just passed away in Arizona and left them a castle. It turned out that Boyce Gully had discovered he had contracted tuberculosis and had opted to move away from his family so they wouldn't catch the disease. He ended up in Phoenix, Arizona. 
There, one could at the time stake a mining claim and obtain land for free. Thus, Boyce Gully obtained some land at the foot of South Mountain in what is today prime real estate location in the middle of Metro Phoenix. Then, with rocks and mortar made of cement and goat milk, he built a castle, adding rejects from a brick factory and all kinds of recycled objects, telephone poles, abandoned the railroad tracks and ties, spent shell casings, rejected lumber, damaged wagon wheels, cook clinkers, refrigerator dishes, and even saguaro cactus skeletons. Mystery Castle includes 18 rooms and 13 fireplaces, a wishing well, an underground bar, a wedding chapel, a floating staircase, a trap door to a dungeon guarded by a metal alligator, among others. Eventually, Boy's Gully fell off his horse, breaking his leg, and discovered he had leukemia, which eventually killed him. Francis and Mary Lou moved into the castle and eventually started selling tickets to the many visitors who wanted to tour the castle. The name Mystery Castle stuck after an article in Life magazine appeared in 1948. Mystery Castle is now listed on the Historic Property Register and as a Phoenix Point of Pride. Marilou became known as the princess, and when I first started taking my students on field trips to Mystery Castle, it was she who led us on castle tours. She passed away in 2010. The second story of rebirth is that of the Salt River, or Rio Salado. This was the river that provided water to those ancient canals dug by the Hohoka, the ones we mentioned in the beginning. Up to the 1920s, people used to be able to swim in the river. However, after 1911 and the building of the Roosevelt Dam, more and more water was diverted for agriculture, industrial, and domestic uses. The big river flowing through the Metro Phoenix area dwindled down to a trickle in the middle of a huge barren ditch. In 1966, the students at the College of Architecture at ASU, Arizona State University, designed their Rio Salado project, which involved developing a green belt along a revitalized river as a series of locks and channels. The project was expanded, included various business, community, and governmental agencies. It was not until 1987 that the project was put to a vote to Maricopa County, proposing a property tax increase to finance it. Every city in Metro Phoenix voted it down, except for the city of Tempe, what to do? Well, Tempe decided to go ahead with the plan and dam the river at the city limits using inflatable dams and thus turning the river into a lake. Finally, on June 22, 1999, water flowed into what is now known as Tempe Town Lake. Today, one can go fishing and boating on the lake while crowds of people from all over Phoenix Metro gather to watch fireworks on July 4th in Tempe Beach Park. On the east side, the Indian Bend Wash Habitat has returned the river to its natural state and become a haven for wildlife and nature lovers. Well, there you have it. A metropolis that lives up to its name. Reborn city, reborn battle, reborn castle, and reborn river. This is Phoenix.